It was a timely introduction, uh, or, or invitation rather, that I got from the uh, TED organizers some months ago when they invited me to be a speaker. Because uh, I had just completed a book about uh, what might be one of the craziest ideas of the 20th century. Um, I think if you got some cultural historians together and they made a list of the top 10 craziest ideas, this particular idea would probably be on just about every list. Um, so I'm going to actually show you a little bit of those, uh, some images from this book about the crazy idea. Um, but as I was thinking about, you know, the, the relevance of this particular crazy idea, I also started thinking about the range of crazy ideas that, that there are. And um, I'm sure everyone in the audience has had a crazy idea. Sometimes, yes. <laughs> sometimes we act on them, sometimes we don't. Often it's better that we don't. Um, there may be someone in the audience right now who has a crazy idea that will lead them to the stage of uh, some stage in Stockholm and the uh, King of Sweden will hang a medal around their neck. Um, there may be some people who have crazy ideas that they will act on that will lead them to desperately calling their friends on a Sunday morning and, and, and begging them not to post those photos from the night before uh, on their Facebook page. So those are kind of extremes, and, 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 and by citing the second, I'm not trying to suggest that, uh, that crazy ideas can't lead society forward, that they can't advance art, that they can't advance technology. This particular idea that I'm going to show you and the woman who uh, formulated it, I'm not sure where to put her in that spectrum between the mortifying crazy idea and the truly glorious crazy idea. Um, there are components of both, I think, in this story, uh, which I will share with you now. So the title of the story is Queen of the Falls. And um, it's about Niagara Falls, an event that happened there in 1901. And the story actually starts in 1901. And... Um, I'll just point out here that I know that there, were a lot, there are probably a lot of young readers who are not familiar with Niagara Falls. They've not been there. They have no idea of the scale of the place. And I did some simple calculation to determine that it's as tall as a seven-story building. And so I wondered, well, how can I, how can I express that to a child? And I thought, well, I'll just put a seven-story building in Niagara Falls. Um, now, I, I only bring that out because I want to get along with the story, but... This may look like a crazy picture, but it grew out of a perfectly rational idea. And sometimes craziness can come from perfectly sane uh, ideas, especially if you're kind of literally minded like I am. So anyway, this story starts out in 1901 on a, on a, uh, a cool October day. And uh, the streets of Niagara are oddly empty. And the reason they're empty is because all of Niagara has gathered around the base of the falls because they're there to witness a spectacle. And here they are witnessing the spectacle. And what the spectacle they've come to see is, is a barrel going over the Niagara Falls. At least that's all the narrative tells us at this point. And I've wondered in the narrative, why would so many people come to see a barrel go over Niagara Falls? The fate of the barrel is almost obvious. Once it goes over the falls, it will hit the bottom, it will break into little bits and pieces, and it will be a little bit like David Letterman dropping watermelons off a parking garage. Um, not much interest in that, except um, that the people who've gathered around the base of the falls know that this barrel is not empty, um, that there's actually a passenger. Uh, and so at this point, the story skips back about two months and about 200 miles from Niagara back to uh, Bay City, Michigan. And we are introduced to a, uh, a 62-year-old widow named Annie Edson Taylor. And Annie, for a time in Bay City, had a thriving uh, business as a charm school teacher where she would teach the, the, uh, the yokels from the hinterlands how to dance the waltz, uh, which fork to eat at dinners that they would probably never be served, and why it's better to use a handkerchief than the back of your hand uh, to dry your nose off. Um, and those were her, that was her mission. 
But as she grew older and Midwesterners lost their sense of inferiority, uh, her charm school shrank. And this is actually an image of, of, of Annie inviting her final student onto the dance floor. Uh, and he looks a little reluctant. So Annie was in desperate straits. She was 62 years old, and back in 1901, there was no such thing as a safety net. And in Annie's case, there was no such thing as a savings account either. And she had a problem to solve. And the problem to, that she had was how to provide for herself in her old age. The option at that point was basically to throw yourself on the mercy of, uh, of your fellow citizens, and that meant going to the poorhouse, uh, a really unhappy and grim place to live out your life. And Annie was determined that that would not be her fate. So she was trying to think of an idea. And this is an important um, sort of point in Annie's story about crazy ideas, and one which I think is relevant to all crazy ideas. She could have, as a 62-year-old woman, chosen to become a seamstress. She could have become some kind of domestic. She could have worked at a store. But they were all too conventional for her. They were all too ordinary for her. She had, she had an idea for herself that was only going to be satisfied by something greater than that. So you would figure, well, all right, a little greater than that. Learn how to ride a horse and, and uh, do tricks on a horse. Um, but she had another idea. And that year, 1901, there was a very large exhibition in the city of Buffalo. The result of this exhibition in Buffalo was that many of the people who went to the exhibition in Buffalo would go on to Niagara Falls. And as a result, in 1901, the falls had much larger groups of tourists at them than, than would ordinarily be the case. Now, Annie had been to the falls as a child. And when she read this newspaper article, which she's doing on your right, left, left, she learned about this, this extraordinary influx of tourists into the falls. And we know at this point she was already sort of belaboring this, this problem, what am I going to do for my future? And in her own description, uh, she said, uh, she describes this, this epiphany, that the thing that she could do to secure her future would be to go over Niagara Falls in a barrel. Now, it had never been done before. Um, some people had tried to dare the falls at the bottom, at the cataract, and some of them had died. Um, but Annie was determined that this could set her free of the financial burdens that she saw as part of her future. So, in some ways, she was driven by desperation. Uh, but it couldn't be desperation alone that, that made her decide that this was a solution for her, a 62-year-old charm school teacher. So anyway, another feature, I think, of the crazy idea is that it's pursued with a kind of passion. And in Annie's own words, she didn't think about going over the falls and then read a little bit about them and think about it for a few days and think about it for a few weeks and then maybe at some point decide, eh, maybe not. Um, Annie got up the next morning and drew a picture of the barrel that she wanted to have constructed for her uh, that she thought would be uh, strong enough and, and efficiently carry her over the falls and allow her to climb out alive. An important feature. Um, so she went to the local coopersmith, and, and, and the coopersmith's ordinary uh, assignments were um, barrels for pickles, barrels for beer. He took a look at this drawing that she'd done, and he, and he said, well, what's this one for? What is this barrel for? I've never seen a, a barrel like this. And, and once again, a feature of the possessor of the crazy idea, does not believe it's crazy, and states very matter-of-factly, I'm going to ride over Niagara Falls in this barrel. So the Cooper Smith is alarmed by this and, and, and basically throws her out of the, uh, uh, of the factory because he says, I will not have a part of your suicide. If you want to kill yourself, go ahead, do it. Um, I'm not going to help. And Annie went back and, and she thought about this for a while, but she had, once again, a feature of the crazy idea, that it could work, that she, though she had very modest engineering skills, had conceived of this barrel so that it was the right size, that it was strong enough. It couldn't be too big, because if it was too big, she'd bounce around inside of it and get broken up. If it was too small, there would not be enough air in it for her to survive the trip. 
So she calculated the size, she calculated the number of iron bands would have to go around it to give it strength, and like a fairy tale, she made three more visits to the coopersmith, and finally he relented, and he put his three best men on the job. And uh, this is an image of Annie, who's uh, picking out the very best pieces of white oak that she can from the, uh, uh, from the wood lot that they have, from the uh, lumber that they have. And on, on uh, your right, I've done a little demonstration that uh, proves that um, it's possible to build something very strong. All of the barrel makers that she's working with agree that this barrel can make it over the falls, possibly even if it hits stone. Maybe not, because it's a monster thing. It's, you know, two and a half inches thick, iron bands around it. But Annie understood that you could take a tin can and place an egg in it and drop it, and the tin can might look just fine, but the egg does not. So that was a little picture that demonstrated Annie's insight into the real engineering problem she had. But this was a twofold crazy idea that Annie had. And um, the other part was not simply going over the falls, but being able to exploit the idea once, she, once she'd done it. So she hired a fellow named Frank Russell, who was basically an ex carney barker. And, um, and when he met Annie, he said uh, he, he, he was incredulous. First off, Annie made a mistake. She believed that the public was more interested in a, uh, a younger uh, daredevil. So she presented herself as a 42-year-old to Frank Russell, who did not believe her. Um, he didn't think anyone else would believe that she was 42. But he did believe if she somehow made it over the falls, climbed out of the barrel, um, that he could make money, and so could she. So Frank Russell was sent off while the final preparations were made on the barrel. He was sent off to Niagara, where he went to the newspapers and said, this daredevil is coming to Niagara to challenge the falls. She will go over it in a barrel. She's 42 years old. She's a, uh, she's a daredevil who climbs mountains and swims frozen lakes. And then, of course, when the 62-year-old woman climbed off the train, the reporters were puzzled. And uh, they made the remark that it looked like she'd spent more time baking pies than climbing mountains. Um, but here's another feature of the crazy idea, which is that Annie was earnest. She did not believe it was crazy. When the reporters interviewed her, they were actually persuaded she intended to do this. That didn't mean they didn't think it was ridiculous, and it didn't mean they didn't think it was deadly. They just believed her. She had conviction. So the barrel went on display in, in, in Niagara's biggest hotel. Um, Frank Russell had already secured the services of a boatman, a riverman, to um, set Annie in the correct place. If she was in the wrong place, the barrel definitely would have broken up on rocks, but, but the, uh, the boatman put her in the right place. Annie, very modest person, made the boatman turn aside when she climbed into her barrel. And uh, then they packed her with pillows, which was something she knew was a requirement. She needed that, so they packed the thing with pillows. And that picture on your right is Annie saying, goodbye, boys. And they towed her out, put her in the right place in the river, cut the ropes, and said adios. Um, now, the roughest part of the ride for Annie was the rapids themselves. because And the rapids kicked around, twirled around, upside down, right side up, just really hammered. And, uh, um, and, and when that was over, you would think, well, she might have a sense of relief. But she knew that for a few moments, there would be, uh, the water would be becalmed at the precipice. And the boatman had warned her, when you feel that, grab onto the, grab onto the hoops that you've got inside, tighten the strap, and say your prayers. And so that's what she's doing here. She says, oh, Lord, and then she was gone. Uh, so here she is inside the barrel. She's headed down. There's the amazed crowd. Not sure if they are about to witness a tragedy or a success. It was a success. Um, Annie was pulled out of the barrel. She was a little banged up. She was taken to her rooms. Uh, some doctors came and, and evaluated her and, and determined that, that she was uh, not suffering any serious injuries. And so very quickly, Frank Russell arrived, or arranged for her to go on the road. And this is the part where Annie's crazy idea turned out to be a little too crazy. Because she presented herself as a 42-year-old, 
and because the publicity that went out ahead of her described her that way, when she finally went to these lecture halls, crowds would come in with an expectation of seeing a certain particular kind of person. They've created in their imagination what a, a brave 42-year-old woman would look like who could do this. And what they found instead was someone who looked like their grandma. And the cognitive dissonance was too great. And, uh, um, and her tour was a failure. And in fact, it was such a failure that Frank Russell abandoned her, stole her barrel. <laughs> and uh, Annie had another barrel made. Um, she found another manager who decided to take her out to carnivals instead of lecture circuits. Annie felt degraded by this. Um, uh, but was no more successful at the carnivals than she was at the, uh, at the th uh, on the lecture circuit. So anyway, Annie's final sort of retreat was that she had a barrel made for herself that was just like the other one. She set it up in a little park near uh, Niagara Falls, and she spent the last 22 years of her life selling little brochures that described her adventure and which she offered to sign. And she would, as people passed through the, the falls, the park near the falls, she would invite them to come over and, and meet the queen of the falls. And, and of course, when everybody met, got up to, their, to her, they, they, they said, well, where is she? And Annie had to convince them that it was her. So on the 10th anniversary of Annie's trip, a newspaper reporter came to her to talk about what it was like now 10 years past, and Annie admitted it was a great disappointment that it had not played out the way she anticipated. She had not been able to have the fame and fortune she believed would be waiting for her. And um, I set this, actually she was not at the park able to view the falls, but I set this here because I wanted Annie to be able to get up and take a step. And what she says to the reporter is simply this. She says, she describes seeing the falls as a child. It was terrifying to her. Um, uh, terrifying to all who see it. And what everyone wonders is, how close were their courage let them get to it? And she says, well, no one's gotten closer than I have. And she goes on to say that if you ask anyone who passes these falls, what they thought of someone going over them in a barrel, why they would say that was the greatest feat ever performed. And, uh, and Annie's final words are, and I am content that I am the one who can say that. Um, so this is the moral of Annie's story, and as it connects to crazy ideas, two, three, one, <laughs> a little bit over. This was the point I wanted to make in the book, was that sometimes if you take a risky idea, if you take a chance, you can, you can, you can be motivated by the acknowledgement and admiration perhaps even wealth that will come to you. But the only thing you can truly, truly depend on is if you accept a challenge which is, which is frightening, that, that demands your courage. What you get on the other side is a simple knowledge that you are the one who did it. So, thank you.